one of the things I responded to a few years ago here in Valhalla, there was a train crash. Six people died and there was a car trying to cross the tracks and the train hit it and six people on the train were killed because they were all in the first car and the, there was a fire. So I heard about it on the radio and I just started driving over there. You're listening to an American Red Cross in Greater New York podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael DeVolpierre, communications officer with the American Red Cross in Greater New York. Today, we'll be sharing our conversation with Red Cross volunteer Alex Sussel. As part of our response to disasters large and small, the American Red Cross often deploys highly specialized teams of mental health professionals to address the emotional impact, the confusion, the grief, the shock that these disasters can inflict. Alec, who is a psychologist, is a member of this Red Cross mental health volunteer team. In this role, he is called to the scene of disasters like fires or floods or other emergencies where there is significant loss of property, possessions, and sometimes pets and loved ones. He also deploys to a different kind of emergency, one where there might not be a loss of property, but there is significant loss of life, like a mass shooting. And unfortunately, over these past few years, this has become a bit of a specialty for Alec. And he has brought his experience and compassion to some unthinkable tragedies, such as shootings in Virginia Beach, Las Vegas, and Parkland, Florida. In our conversation, we talked about his background, how he intervenes following some of the most tragic moments imaginable, and the support he receives from fellow Red Cross volunteers and, of course, from his family. So joining me here in our interview with Alex Cecil is my colleague, Abigail Adams, who's a fellow communications officer, longtime Red Crosser. Thank you, Abby, for coming. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Alec, thank you so much for coming to talk with us today. Um, you have such a rich Red Cross experience and a lot to share with us, so thanks. Well, thank you. Happy to be here. So let's just start off by talking a little bit about you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and where you're from? Well, I grew up in Westchester County. Uh, went to Edgemont High School, you know where that is, and I, I'm a psychologist, and most of my career has been focused on working with adolescents. Much of it, I was in the Bronx. Basically, my whole career, I've worked in public or kind of quasi-public mental health, worked with people primarily from low-income backgrounds, and you know, people who can afford private practice psychotherapy, particularly in the New York area, have no dearth of choices, but people who can't, it's often not that easy to find good, good therapists. And so I, I guess I feel proud that I've done that really for most of my life. What do you think is the biggest apprehension your clients have before speaking to a psychologist? Well, I think trust is a big a big thing for a lot of reasons. A lot of the folks I work with have grown up in environments where, you know, it's not unreasonable not to be too trusting. And there are also lessons about not sort of sharing your business outside of the family or outside people are close to you, sometimes for cultural or psychological reasons and sometimes for real genuine fears in the environments. People also sometimes, because there is unfortunately still a stigma about mental illness or even talking to a psychologist or therapist. So they, they're afraid. I actually had one patient, this was years ago, who said, who talked about he, what he was afraid of was that I could, I could put him away. You know, if he said the wrong thing, I might put him in the hospital. What would you tell him? Well, that's not really what I'm there to do. And I try not to, I try my best not to do that, which is another factor in a way maybe that, makes me or helps me be suited to the Red Cross work is being willing to tolerate some risk in a way. It takes a lot, it's a lot easier when you do what I do if people start talking in certain ways to say, well, we're going to put you in the hospital. I generally think it's better if I can help keep them out of the hospital, help them stay out of the hospital. But that, that often involves a lot more anxiety on my part in terms of their safety. And so, um, you know, that's a challenge also. And everybody's kind of different on that in terms of where they are as an individual. 
It's, it's kind of a good segue because you talk about the Red Cross and how it's different. So I think we are the only charity that does mental health support or nonprofit. So why do you think that's so important to do for people who are facing these traumas? Fortunately, most of the people we see are physically okay. They've gotten out. They may have lost their home. They may dis be displaced. They may have to deal with some real difficulties in terms of getting resettled and just a lot of real world issues, but there's a tremendous amount of stress. And often they're experiencing things they're not used to experiencing because they've been through a very unusual event in a way. And so helping them recognize that what they're going through, given the events, is not unusual. It's fairly typical to experience a lot of the thoughts and feelings. So I can reassure them they're not going crazy and, and then to help them manage the stress and that can help them then move forward with the, with the task that they need to complete and engage in to get resettled and put their lives back together. So what's the, the body language that you're looking for in a, a reception center uh, or a family assistance center that? Well, some of it, some things are obvious. Uh, if somebody's crying or they're hunched over or, uh, they're being comforted by f friends or family. Um, sometimes people are isolated, just sitting off by themselves, maybe have kind of a blank look. Uh, maybe sometimes people are pacing. And some of it is really, as I said, I kind of walk around, I say hello to people, see if they say hello, see what their voice sounds like when they do that. How are you? Some people say, okay, fine. Some people will open up. Generally, Obviously, I try to follow up, you know, and see see if people are interested in talking, but I don't want to push too hard because I don't think that would be helpful either. Everybody is you know, kind of in their own time and they have their own way of dealing with it. There's not one right or wrong way to deal with a crisis or even a tragedy. A lot of it really is just kind of showing up and uh, being calm. People often comment that that's one of the things I seem to bring is the sense of being calm and not getting too worked up. Maybe some of that goes back to my, well, maybe just me, but also my work in my work with adolescents. I can tell you people who don't work with adolescents often are very quick to kind of get upset when they start to get loud or stomp around and um, it's okay though, you know, <laughs> uh, figure it out. And so I think a lot of that is recognizing people when they're struggling often seem a little out of control, but usually they'll get back in control. And most people are resilient and certainly with a little bit of intervention, we can help them get back in control and start to think about, okay, now what's my next step and, and break it down. Cause really, you need, okay, what am I going to do in the next few minutes? What am I going to do in the next hour? What am I going to do the rest of the day? What about tomorrow? Then next week, then maybe after that. But when they try to think of, oh, it's, it, it's overwhelming to them. They've lost everything. How do they even begin? And so we can help them take a deep breath, calm down a little bit, and think more clearly about their next steps. How about when there's a loss of life? Because you've dealt so, with quite a bit of many incidents. Where I, I have. That's unfortunately become a little bit of a, I don't want to say a specialty, but I've been to actually quite a number of incidents where someone has died, sometimes a bunch of people, sometimes, you know, just a single fatality or in a fire. So that's certainly different. It's sadder in a lot of ways. And, you know, that's not something that you can say, okay, we're, it's not something you can fix, right? So you have to be willing to just be with people in their grief and some of it's the same, trying to help them see that, you know, they can still be okay and that they can manage this, but we can't take it away. We can't undo what happened. We can't say, oh, everything's going to be fine, even though most people are resilient and we can try to re uh, reassure them over time. Realistically, it's very important to be realistic about that and not just pretend everything's going to be great. And a lot of it is really just being able to sit with people. And it can be very sad. And I know for us, that's where we really have to do a lot of work with, with other Red Crossers and even with ourselves uh, because there's a, 
particularly in a mass casualty event, there's just this kind of overwhelming sadness that's part of the atmosphere almost. What has inspired you the most um, responding to these incidents? Well, you're making me think about stuff. I think one of the one of the things that I am struck by is the dedication and commitment of Red Cross volunteers. You know, that people show up and do what they need to do. And, you know, we all are a little quirky. We have our idiosyncrasies. My wife refers to the Red Cross as a weird cult. And uh, she's not necessarily wrong. <laughs> but, you know, we, we're there. And people show up. And there, there are a lot of people who, you know, I say sometimes, particularly locally, like I have the easy, I have the easy job. You know, because the DAT responders go and they, and I, then they call me and I'll come in and, you know, I just have to talk to people, but it's like anything else. When, when it's what you do, it doesn't feel so hard. You, you know what you do, but sometimes it's hard to, to maintain the confidence. But anyway, so I think it's a lot of it is the other volunteers who come out and, and, you know, you meet people who you would never otherwise meet when you go on a national response, because there are people from all over the country and all different kinds of backgrounds and professions. I'm not just talking about the mental health people, really everybody. And, and even among the mental health people, there are people who have all different kind of professional backgrounds, counselors, social workers, psychologists, psychiatric nurses, and different ways of working. But, uh, we make it work. So that's one. And the other is really the resilience of a lot of the clients we see. You know, they've been through a lot and they're thanking us for showing up. And as I said, a lot of it, that's, that's a lot of it showing up and just being there and being willing to be with people and, and trying to, one of the challenges is kind of to keep, to keep our egos out of it in a way, because as with any, organization sometimes there are tensions and conflicts and um so a lot of it is being being willing to have the patience but i've seen a lot of folks who i you know other red crossers who i kind of marvel at how they're able to do what they do in in some of these situations and also the other people in the community communities really step up and it's pretty remarkable not just through churches or organized things, but everybody shows that they want to help. People want to help when something bad happens. What would you say has been your biggest challenge since joining the Red Cross? One of the things I responded to a few years ago here in Valhalla, there was a train crash. Six people died, and there was a car trying to cross the tracks, and the train hit it, and six people on the train were killed because they were all in the first car, and the, there was a fire. So I heard about it on the radio and I just started driving over there, even though we're not technically supposed to do that. Anyway, I was there all night and dealt with most of the families and there were some other of our local DMH folks who came and, and it was pretty much all over in 24 hours because there are a lot of local resources. There were families, so we didn't need to mount a big response. But for me, it was difficult for a number of reasons. One it hit very close to home. These were people commuting home on the train. The people on the train who died were all men. Could have been me. Uh, anyway, so for probably a few years after that, every time I saw a train crossing, I remembered that event. On the other hand, the positive is I think that I was, I and my colleagues were able to be quite helpful even in that brief period of time following a real tragedy and helping some of the families, particularly one of the things was how can they talk to their kids? So it was a lot of moms who came to pick up dad at the train where they, they left the house and they, then they had to go home and, you know, tell their kids that their father was gone. And, um, how do you do that? For someone involved in this type of volunteer work, mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's so critical to have, strong support system at home. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, so I'll tell you another story. I'm going to be 
open. So when I, I went to Parkland in Florida after the school shooting there. So I came home and I, I actually didn't go right home because my son and my not yet daughter-in-law, we were meeting where they were going to get married to go over the plans. And anyway, so I went and uh, was at a friend's house and they were all there and I get there. It was early in the evening and, you know, we hang out and we watch a movie and, and time to go to bed. And my wife and I go upstairs to our bedroom and I just started crying. And, you know, that's okay. Uh, the other thing is I do have a family. I love last night was my wife's birthday. We had dinner with our kids and at my, one of my son's apartments in the city. And there's nothing I like better than that, you know, being with my, my wife and my kids. So uh, that's helpful. And I have a lot of friends. We have social life. And as I say, the Red Cross is really a, a source of strength because, you know, there are a lot of good people who do this work. And I, whether I come to meetings or, responses, I always feel in some way at least rejuvenated and comforted by being with, you know, the other volunteers and, and staff. So I think that's helpful also. Is there a piece of advice you would give to someone, not necessarily in your field, not necessarily with the Red Cross, what they could do to support a loved one or a friend who's experienced trauma. I think the most important thing is being willing to be with them in their struggle and let them know we're not going to give up on them and we're going to be with them. And look, they already know what we think. I, I told you my career is primarily working with adolescents. And obviously there are a lot of conflicts between teenagers and their parents. And I would often say to a parent who's keeps telling their kid, whatever, that do you think your kid knows what you think by now or what you want or what your values are and what advantage is there by continuing to repeat that? You know, they know now it's a struggle, right? I, my kids were teenagers once I was a teenager. I wasn't the greatest, but nevertheless, there's only so much you can do and being willing to be with people and just sit with them is, is I think one of the most important things and not, try to change them, particularly not too quickly. Do you think that the Red Cross has changed you in any way? I, I say this, it sounds corny, but I think I'm a better person for having done the work I do with the Red Cross. What do you think is the biggest difference between you, you today and you before the Red Cross? Well, that's a good question. I should probably revise that. I don't know that I'm always a better person, <laughs> but in many ways, particularly when I am doing the Red Cross work, I am aware that I am representing the Red Cross and not just myself. And I think that kind of helps me in certain ways be on my best behavior. You know, I drive a little more carefully and, but uh, just in my general behavior, but it gives me an appreciation for what people go through, you know, and that, that it's not about me, you know, whatever we all have our issues and problems and struggles and, and not to make light of them or downplay them. But when you see some of the real tragedies or real disasters that people go through and how resilient they can be and how they, you know, find their way back and you know, that we're a little part of helping them do that. That's very rewarding. And it's also humbling. So we um, like to close out these interviews with one question that we've been trying to ask everybody that we've been talking to. Mm -hmm. So what piece of advice would you give to someone who wants to make a difference in the world? Be humble. And am I allowed more than one? <laughs> uh, <No>. I think <laughs> I think there are a lot of ways that people can make a difference. And so just like I was saying about being a therapist, find a way that works for you. And every little bit helps. Sometimes people think, oh, I have to make, do something grand or dramatic. And, you know, some people will and some people can, but most of the time it takes a bunch of people working together. 
And kind of like the Red Cross, I think if you look at what we do as an organization, it's pretty dramatic. But if you look at any what one of us does, we're just a piece of the piece of the pie. And so recognize that. And what I said earlier, it's not really about you. You want to be helpful, and but not not make it about you. Make it about the people you're trying to help, and recognize that you can make a difference. As I said before by just showing up. Well, thank you, Alec, for talking to us. You're welcome. Thank you. I enjoyed thank it. Thank you, Happy Alec. thanks. Hey, no, it was great to sit in. Inspiring. Big thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to hear more, please share, like, subscribe, or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. As a new podcast, we really want to hear from you, our listeners. To learn more about the work of the Red Cross, visit redcross.org. This episode was produced by Chi Kong Lu and edited by Sue Tran. Special thanks to Michael Freiberg and Connor Lennon for their support. Thank you all for listening, and we hope you'll join us for the next episode.